Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to our Climate Action Accelerator webinar. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, my name is Sonia Schmid. Uh, I'm the focal point for procurement within the solutions team of the Climate Action Accelerator. The topic that we're covering today is um, how buyers can make more sustainable choices when procuring pharmaceuticals. Um, we have uh, three great speakers uh, with us today that I will present uh, in a moment. Um, before we get started um, with the webinar, um, I just want to give some practical information. Next slide, please, Pia. So um, in, in a few minutes, we're going to be starting with the presentations that will be followed by a Q&A session. So please uh, do ask your questions um, during the Q&A session or during the presentations already, if you wish, um, in the chat or raise your hand. Um, we're going to be finishing at 2.30 p.m. CT time. Um, the webinar is recorded. It will be made available on replay on our website and on our YouTube channel. We kindly ask you to keep your audio and video off it at all times, um, of course, uh, unless during uh, the Q&A session when you, when you would like to ask a question. Um, as said, to ask a question, uh, please write it in the chat or raise your hand during the Q&A session and we will then give you the floor or read out your question. Uh, for this webinar, we also have uh, translation um, available uh, via Zoom. Um, if you could just go into the next slide. So very quickly, um, you see at the bottom of your screen, you'll see um, uh, either in, in, in English, it's show captions or in French, uh, afficher les sous-titres. So you can click on this box or, or the little arrow, and then you just have to select the spoken language and the language you want to tra translate into. Um, so that it allows you to have basically subtitles um, where, whilst people speak. Um, just a few words on the on the initiative. Uh, sorry, I just have to set my language. Sorry, just bear with me two seconds. Okay. Um, so the Climate Action Accelerator is a non-profit organization based in Geneva. Uh, we're aiming to scale up climate action within notably the international aid and health sector. The CAA supports its partner organizations towards a radical transformation, um, towards a radical transformation of their practices and enabling them to halve their emissions by 2030. Um, so far, more than 20 organizations have joined the Climate Action Accelerator and committed to reducing their emissions by 50% by 2030. Um, they benefit on the one hand from close support of the initiative in building their environmental roadmap and action plans, as well as a network to exchange good practices with, with their peers and other partners. We're also an official partner of the Race to Zero initiative of the United Nations Framework Con Convention on, on Climate Change. Um, so today we're going to be co covering the, the topic of um, procurement of pharmaceuticals. If you just move to the next slide, please, Pierre. Um, so just as an intro, um, what is the sort of, why is this issue important? Um, why did we choose uh, to, to cover this topic? Um, so when we look at overall um, the impact of the healthcare sector, uh, it's estimated to be around 4.4% uh, of global net emissions. So just as a comparison, the, the global air and, and ship transport uh, is roughly 4%. Uh, so just to give you sort of an, an order of, of the things we talk about. Um, then when we look into what is the, the, um, the footprint of the procurement of pharmaceuticals, um, there are estimations that range from 10 to 55 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions of health systems. For example, when we look at the NHS, I've put the, uh, their um, carbon footprint uh, with the different scopes in there and, and the different categories. Um, it uh, amounts to 20 percent. Uh, of their uh, total footprint. Um, it's similar for other uh, health systems, uh, similar rates for, the, for Australia. 
Um, it's also uh, similar to what we see with some of our partner organizations that have a strong uh, health uh, element uh, in their programming. So the impact of the procurement of pharmaceuticals is uh, quite significant, and that's what we want to focus on today. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we have three speakers with us today that I would already really very much like to thank for their participation today. Um, we have Dr. Amy Booth, uh, who's a medical doctor and a PhD researcher at the University of Oxford. Um, she recently wrote a paper on the targets and strategies of pharmaceutical companies to address climate change, and she will present some key findings um, during the session today. We also have um, Adam Eisenstein from Tiva Pharmaceutical Industry, which is a global leader in, generic, uh, in generics and innovative medicines. And he will provide an introduction to Tiva's strategy to reduce emissions and, and protect the environment. And last but not least, we have Courtney Soulsby from BSI Group, a British standards institutions. She's the global director um, of the healthcare and life science sector team at BSI. And she will provide an introduction into the project of developing a common methodology um, to measure the carbon impact of pharmaceuticals. Um, so I will hand over to, to Amy. Amy, if you could just bring up your slides, please. And sure. over to you, thank you. Yeah, so you just need to stop sharing yours and then I can share mine. Perfect. Great, can everyone see that? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, perfect. Okay, well, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. And it's really a pleasure to be part of what is a very important uh, webinar on how do we procure pharmaceuticals sustainably. As uh, Sonia mentioned, uh, I'm a researcher at the University of Oxford, and my research is really looking at what the industry is doing to tackle its, its climate impact. So I'm going to be presenting a little bit of the work that we are doing on that topic today. Just a brief background though, so we know that climate change is going to have a massive impact on our population health. And when we think about this, we know that this is going to increase the burden on our health systems, which will inevitably lead to us having to procure more pharmaceuticals to treat these conditions. At the same time, the pharmaceuticals that we use has an impact on the environment. So Sonja mentioned the, the climate impact that it has, but it also has a broader environmental impact as well. So it, it almost becomes this, this vicious circle that we need to consider uh, in this agenda. As, uh, as mentioned, healthcare contributes about 4% of global greenhouse gas emissions, and of that pharmaceuticals forms a massive proportion. So it's really important to, to start thinking about what we can do from a pharmaceutical perspective. But as I mentioned, it's not just about the carbon footprint. We also know that pharmaceuticals comes wrapped in lots of plastic that ends up in our, our waste streams. We also know that pharmaceuticals leak into our environment and our water sources, and that this can contribute to ecotoxicity and uh, health impacts like antimicrobial resistance. So while I I'm going to be focusing predominantly on the climate impact in this presentation. I think it's just important to bear in mind the other environmental impacts as well. The good news is that health systems are committing to reducing their environmental impact, but obviously in order to do this, it requires the industry, specifically the pharmaceutical industry, to align with this as well. And, and really actions across the entire supply chain from the raw material sourcing to the manufacturing of pharmaceuticals, to packaging of it, to the procurement, to the prescription and use, and to the end of life management of it. And this is where I think procurers have a really important role to play because they can not only influence downstream uh, prescribing and what medication is available to healthcare professionals and patients, but they can also influence upstream manufacturing. They influence policy and regulations and, and vice versa, policy and regulations can influence procurement, as we know. I, as I mentioned, will be specifically focusing on what the industry is doing and having a chat about some of the, the work that, as I mentioned, we've done at the University of Oxford. So as mentioned, we have recently published a paper which looked at the pharmaceutical company targets and uh, strategies to reach these targets. 
In this research, we looked specifically at the top 20 pharmaceutical companies by revenue at the time, and we collected data across their websites, so their sustainability tabs, company reports. Uh, at this time, it was their 2020 and 2021 company reports, and really looked at what climate change targets companies are setting. Are they reporting on their greenhouse gas emissions? And if so, are they showing any improvements in these? And what strategies are they reporting implementing to reduce these climate change, uh, to, to reduce their emissions and meet these climate change targets? Um, I just will premise this with the fact that companies have since published later, so 2022 and 2023 reports. So this is really a snapshot of, of their previous reports. So some of the data will have changed since then. To, to give a brief sort of background in terms of some of the technical things that, that we'll discuss though, so some of you might be aware that when we speak about greenhouse gas emissions, we usually speak about them in three scopes. So scope one being the emissions that a company will produce within its own operations. So the energy that they use at their sites or the fuel that they use to, to um, power vehicles that they own. Scope two are the indirect emissions from that energy. So how it's manufactured and distributed to where it's used. And then scope three really encompasses everything else. So this is where the supply chain fits in. It's where business travel, employee travel fits in, uh, distribution, waste, uh, et cetera. And as you can imagine, scope three emissions generally form the bulk of the company's uh, carbon footprint. When we talk about climate targets, it can sometimes be quite confusing to unpack what the different targets mean. But uh, just to, to give a brief overview, usually, you'll see things like carbon neutrality or commitments to net zero. And just to note that net zero is a lot more of a stringent and ambitious target. It involves all of the greenhouse gas emissions as opposed to carbon neutrality, which by definition just involves carbon dioxide. And it also involves a lot less uh, reliance on carbon offsetting. So really net zero is the standard that we should be aiming for. Uh, obviously, though, it's it's also good to align this with science, and there is an organization known as the Science-Based Targets Initiative, which at the moment uh, is sort of the gold standard with setting these targets, and they have uh, a net zero standard which companies should ideally align their target settings to, and this involves a near-term target and a long-term target. So the near term will be a percentage emission reduction by a, a target year based on these, these formulas. So for example, if a company has a, a baseline year of 2020 and an end target year of 2030, ideally they should reduce their scope one and two by 42% and scope three by 25% according to this formula. So that obviously um, aligns quite well with what the Climate Action Accelerator has, has um, asked its clients to commit to, so 50% by 2030, and that's really uh, along this aim to halve emissions by then. If companies commit to these near-term targets, then it implies that they are on a trajectory to reach net zero by 2050, and that's where the long-term target comes in, where companies aim to reduce their scope one, two, and three emissions to zero, with minimal offsetting. So the maximum amount of carbon offsetting allowed in this instance is 10% or less. So that's just a brief overview of, of some of the science behind these targets. So what did we find? When we published this, uh, this paper, as I mentioned, we used the 2020 and 2021 company reports. And at the time, nine companies had committed to carbon neutrality, eight to net zero and uh, 16 to uh, percentage emission reductions. I wanted to present a slightly more up-to-date uh, targets for, for this presentation though, so these targets that are presented here were checked last week, so they are the most up-to-date targets that we have on some of these companies. And you'll see that a lot has changed since then, so a lot more companies have made commitments to net zero. But I think, again, what's really important for uh, procurers in this agenda is, do companies have targets in the first instance do their targets cover all their scopes, so scope one, two, and three? And you'll see that in, in the brackets, the numbers one, two, and three indicates which scopes these companies have uh, committed to. And are these targets aligned with science? So with the 1.5 degree scenario, do they sign up for the science-based targets initiative, uh, et cetera? In terms of the company emissions that, that we found in our research, 
again, this is based on the, the 2020 emissions that companies reported. So some of these uh, statistics have changed somewhat, but I think that this graph shows a few points quite well. Firstly, you'll see that companies have actually managed to make quite good uh, reductions in their greenhouse gas emissions, especially in their scope one and two uh, emissions. Scope three is slightly more diverse. So you'll see some have increased, some have managed to show reductions. At the time, some companies weren't reporting on their scope three emissions. Although again, this has changed and a lot more of these companies have reported on these since. But I think another thing just to, to draw out when you, uh, when you look at what um, emission reductions companies have demonstrated is that you should compare these uh, reductions with caution because companies have different baseline years of reporting, different baseline carbon footprints, they run different operations. So, so really I think what's important in this is showing that companies have managed to reduce within their own operations. So compare company to the same company as opposed to, to companies with each other. The other thing that, that I just will draw attention to is to check what uh, emissions companies are reporting. So you might be tempted to look at these um, three companies that seem to have made really good scope three reductions, but that's because they only reported on business travel and their reporting period covered the COVID pandemic. So it was easy to show reductions in that sense. In terms of the strategies, though, companies have uh, reported a range of initiatives that they're rolling out. So common ones were engaging with uh, purchasing renewable energy, optimizing energy efficiency within their operations, sustainable logistics. So switching from air travel to, to ship travel, sourcing sustainably, uh, eco design. So this is where principles like green chemistry come into play, reducing employee and business travel. Uh, end of life programs, so for example, take back programs for their products, engaging with suppliers, which is obviously a really important thing if they want to reduce their scope three emissions. And then, of course, some companies were also engaging with carbon offsetting. I also want to draw attention to some sort of innovative uh, initiatives that some companies are engaging with. So, as uh, some of you might know, asthma inhalers are have a very high carbon footprint. And GSK, for example, has engaged in a clinical trial where they are switching out the propellant in those inhalers. And if that trial is, is successful, it will reduce the carbon footprint of those inhalers by 90%, which is a really exciting initiative. Novo Nordisk uh, collects their insulin pens and turns them into other products like chairs. Astellas, uh, for example, is engaging in research on how they can reduce the packaging size. Uh, AstraZeneca is looking at uh, using things like photosynthesis and, and photon energy to improve the efficiency of their um, of their manufacturing. And then the sort of broader industry initiatives as well. So the Energize program, which uh, brings together uh, industry partners to help suppliers to source sustainable, uh, to source renewable energy, the RE, EV and EP100, which are initiatives that companies commit to to source renewable energy and electric vehicles, and then sort of broader, uh, more higher level initiatives like the Sustainable Markets Initiative, where big pharma companies have come together to work towards decarbonizing healthcare. Um, Teva's obviously doing a lot as well, but I will leave Adam to, to go through some of those exciting initiatives. So, I mean, based on, on all of this, um, you know, information about what the industry is currently doing, I'd, I'd like to just pull out, I think, a few considerations for procurers when we consider this. So firstly, when you look at, at companies, just check whether they report on the, all of their greenhouse gas emissions. It's, it's really important to check footnotes as well when you look at that. And in terms of reporting those emissions, are they using globally accepted guidelines? Are they calculating them efficiently? Um, and are they showing where they get data from? It is interesting to look at whether they've been able to demonstrate any reduction in emissions. But again, I will caution you to also look at the baseline year uh, to consider baseline greenhouse gas emissions. It's very easy for a company that has a very large baseline carbon footprint to show reductions as opposed to a company that already has quite a low carbon footprint. And then consider the company's operations and the external context. We must bear in mind that we are operating in a world that is complex, that is um, is experiencing war, energy crises, 
uh, companies are operating across global geographic locations, which might not, for example, have the infrastructure in place for some of these initiatives like renewable energy as well. So consider all of these things when uh, looking at that. Again, do they have targets? Do the targets cover all the scopes and are they aligned with science? And then do they have a detailed plan as to how they're going to reach these targets and reduce their emissions? I think it's all very well to commit to a target, but you also have to show evidence that you're thinking about how you're going to reach it. And, and of course, those are criteria that are looking at the sort of broad carbon footprint, but as we mentioned, um, there are other things that we need to consider. So I'd like to draw your attention to a couple of other guidelines that speak about how we can procure sustainably. So the UN has one, healthcare without harm, practice green health in the, in the US, the EU has, has one, and then the NHS in the UK also has one. And, and there's a couple scattered around the world as well. And yes, what other criteria? So we should also be thinking about uh, procuring along the lines of uh, other environmental impacts, so pharmaceuticals in the environment. Uh, the MCF classifiers is an, an initiative that is looking at product carbon footprints, so whether we should pr be procuring along uh, product lines as opposed to company uh, as a whole. And then um, Courtney will speak to some of the environmental criteria that they are considering in the, the BSI initiative. So I think in conclusion, the climate crisis is a really urgent thing. It's going to impact on health systems in terms of, of burdening health systems, but it also requires health systems to, to take a role in reducing their own uh, climate impact. The pharmaceutical industry is taking up this fight, it is showing action and getting involved, but obviously there's always room for further action, novel solutions and, and collaborations to further this agenda. And then really there is such an important role for procurers to play in this to motivate upstream action and downstream sustainable prescribing. But again, a lot of work still needs to be done to think about what criteria should be in, included in, in, in procurement and how access to this data will be uh, thought of. So with that, thank you very much. And I look forward to the rest of the presentations. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, I'll hand over to Adam. Uh, Pierre, if you could just pull up the slides, please. It's going to be there in a moment. Adam, the floor is yours. Great. So thank you very much. Um, thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Amy, um, and everyone for joining. My name is Adam Eisenstein. I'm um, Senior Director of ESG, Reporting and Engagement at Teva Pharmaceuticals. And over the next few minutes, I'm just going to speak to you a little bit around our ESG strategy and then drill down into environment and then into decarbonization and what we're doing around that. So next slide, please. So on a daily basis, um, Teva provides its medicines to around 200 million people. Um, and that obviously comes with a, a large complex operation. So we have something like 36, 37,000 employees um, 48,000 suppliers and 53 manufacturing facilities across the world. Um, so that really is a complex task to then manage all the production and logistics. And then obviously that has an environmental impact, which we try and mitigate and manage to the best we can. Next slide, please. Um, one of the things that is crucial for Teva, and it's really ingrained into our mission um, as a company, is around access to medicines. So as a generic supplier, um, we're actually the largest generic medicine company in terms of volume um, in the world. Um, we manage access to medicines through two ways. First of all, by making our generic medicines, which are more affordable and high quality, available to people across the world who may otherwise not be able to um, afford medical treatments. So you can see here, um, just in terms of 2022 statistics, then the number um, of marketing authorizations we, we've been able to make. Um, and that's really um, providing medicines which otherwise wouldn't be available to these different countries and different populations where they're, they're being um, managed. Um, we also provide medicines to people through another route. Um, and this is through our donations and other um, programs in terms of access. So we work with partners closely um, to make sure that we can get medicines 
to low and middle income countries, for example, um, but also into countries where to populations which wouldn't otherwise get them either. Um, so just in 2022, um, our medicines donated um, in, in, to patients in need were 533.7 um, million units. Next slide, please. So our carbon strategy and environment strategy all rolls up into our environmental, social and governance strategy. So I'm sure you probably all heard the term ESG. Um, and this is how we manage it in Teva. So I'm going to walk you through a little bit our strategy um, and how, how it all works. Next slide, please. So in 2020, we developed our ESG strategy, and it's really focused on three, the three pillars of ESG. And it's around minimizing the impact of our operations and products on the planet, advancing health and equity, equity through our medicines and across our business, and dedicating ourselves to quality, ethics, and transparency. And we all know that um, we need a healthy planet in order to have healthy people. So there's a, a very strong correlation um, between the three different pillars of ESG and the healthcare sector. Um, if you click again, we can just take a, a deeper dive into our ESG strategy. Um, so on environment, and I'm just gonna focus on this today, um, we're really focused on climate action and resilience emissions, effluence, and waste, which includes the work we're doing around pharmaceuticals in the environment and antimicrobial resistance as well, and then also responsible use of natural resources. Next slide, please. So we manage our ESG strategy um, through four key areas. So um, this is our codification of ESG and Teva. Um, the first thing we, we've done is really set very strong targets around different criteria and different areas of, of our business related to ESG. In fact, one of the things we've done in the last couple of years is also tie these targets to our financial strategy. Um, so we, we're the world's largest issuer of sustainability linked bonds. Um, so as of now, we have seven and a half billion dollars of um, funding, um, which is connected to us achieving and meeting our greenhouse gas emission targets and access to medicine targets. So this is a really important thing because it really shows and ties how we manage ESG um, with how the business is operating. So it's all rolled in and core to the business. Um, on a second note, enhancing reporting and disclosures, so back to Amy's point earlier, um, we really do try and transport, um, report transparently. And we put all our data out there. It's all in our ESG reports um, with many, many indicators for you to kind of roll through and, and um, look how we perform on a, on a historic basis as well. So you can see our trends. Um, thirdly, we integrate it into our business. So I mentioned the SLBs, but we do this through other ways as well, such as managing our climate risks, um, which are integrated um, into the business. And we're working more on that as um, new regulations come in and different um, standards are, are coming in around this area of climate risk. And fourthly, I'm strengthening our governance structure. So over the last couple of years, we put a lot of effort to get ESG um, really being managed and seen and overseen by different levels of the organization. Um, so right from kind of the shop floor level, um, we have clear governance structures which go all the way up to our board of directors. Um, we have a CEO led um, ESG steering committee and anything around ESG is definitely looked at, um, managed and we um, work with many others in the organization to build our strategy and the plans. Next slide, please. So I said I was gonna drill down into the environment and, and this is the slide for doing that. Um, so in terms of what we're doing at Teva on environment, I mentioned the three core or three um, key areas that we're looking at. Um, so we have climate action and resilience and we have some targets um, which I'll speak about on the next slide. Um, so I'm gonna save that for later. Um, but in the areas of responsible use of natural resources, um, we are working on energy efficiency. Um, we already achieved our 10% reduction, sorry, our 10% increase in efficiency target. Um, we're working on increasing the, the proportion of renewable electricity um, that we either generate or purchase. 
in the organization to 50%. We're currently on, currently on 41%. Um, we reduced the total water withdrawal um, in areas which are water stressed. Um, so that's really to, to manage our climate risk, but also ensure that populations um, that live near us also have the water required um, for their needs. And then finally, emissions, effluents, and wastes. So over here, we're committed to recycling um, and, respond, and use responsibly sourced materials um, for packaging, for example. We minimize our waste and the waste that we can't minimize, um, we, we've committed to managing that um, through reuse and recycling, etc. cetera. Um, and then the last thing is around um, pharmaceuticals in the environment. So we do have dedicated targets around assessing um, pharmaceuticals in the environment at our facilities. Um, and regarding access to medicine, which is a subsect of PI or pharmaceuticals in the environment, over here we've also committed to assess um, our impact um, to the, the environment um, at these various facilities which manufacture antimicrobials and across our supply chain as well. Next slide, please. So I mentioned I'll come back to the greenhouse gas emission target. So we're, we're really proud because um, just at the end of last year, um, we did um, achieve validation of our science-based targets. Um, so this was a, a big deal for us. Um, it's not an easy task, um, but it, it shows our commitment um, to being aligned with the Paris Climate Agreement. So our scope one and two target, which has been validated, um, is a reduction of 46% by 2030 as compared to 2019. And that target is aligned with um, a one and a half degree Celsius pathway. Our scope three target um, requires us to reduce our scope three emissions, our value chain emissions by 25% by 2030 as compared to 2020. And this is aligned to a well below two degrees Celsius target. So for scope one and two, you can see our performance so far. So 24% um, the, at the end of last year, by the end of last year. And for scope three, a 12% reduction against the baseline by the end of last year. So we are making good progress. Um, we have many plans in place to, to continue that progress, um, both internally, but also through our value chain, which we're working with closely on this effort. Next slide, please. Um, so to wrap up, I'm just going to spend a few moments um, talking around our decarbonization plan. And what you see on the slide here is really around our, our own operations. Um, we do have a separate plan in place for our scope three, our value chain emissions. Um, but just conscious of time, I'm not going to, to refer to that too much. But we do have a, a very strong engagement plan um, and work with our scope three, uh, with our suppliers. Um, including in certain programs such as Energize, which Amy mentioned earlier. So we're a partner in that organization and that initiative. Um, so yeah, working closely with our scope three and not forgetting that because it's, um, it's often, and in most cases, the largest part of a company's um, carbon footprint. So what we're doing around our scope one and two emissions, um, we really focus in three key areas. Um, so we're calling these our levers. Um, so our energy and process efficiency lever is really around how we can um, be more efficient with the energy we, we have as an organization, which we use as an organization. So what we do, for example, is first of all, try and identify opportunities to, to be more energy efficient. Um, often these are things which aren't um, significantly costly. Um, and can also be identified by, by our site teams, whether that be engineering or our EHS teams um, going around the facilities and, and trying to identify opportunities. Um, so things such as um, putting um, insulation on piping, which might be carrying hot or cold water or steam. Um, and that's really a, a, a very easy and efficient process to, to implement. Um, it could be, for example, identifying leaks in air compressed, compressed air systems, um, which over time results in quite a lot of energy waste. And by just doing simple solutions and fixes and, and, and maintenance, we can already reduce a lot of energy at our sites. Another approach we do is through energy audits. So we do use um, specialist vendors um, who come in and do um, audits at our facilities, energy audits, and we'll spend several weeks at our sites with um, 
very complex pieces of equipment to identify opportunities and measure where we might be able to identify um, opportunities. And those energy audits are done. Um, they'll come out with recommendations on how we can um, reduce some of that wastage. Um, and it could be more complex and kind of cumbersome projects. So whether that be switching out a boiler, a steam boiler and replacing it with a, a far more modern and efficient boiler um, to changing out chillers and HVAC systems and, and lighting to, to much more efficient um, alternatives. Um, so this is something we're focused on and doing at several of our sites in parallel. Um, and we, we're sure that this is going to continue with some of the energy reductions we've achieved so far. On renewable electricity procurement and generation, so that middle bucket, um, in fact, the picture you can see on, on the slide here is of a recently commissioned solar farm at a, one of our sites in Croatia. Um, it's the second largest um, solar farm in Croatia and the, the most powerful um, solar plant in Croatia. So we're really proud of this one. And it's generating around 28% of that site's electricity needs, um, which is a rarity um, because most sites and not just Teva, but most industrial facilities, they have a, a lack of space. Um, so having such solar farms is a, a real asset, um, but not very common. Um, we're, we're very fortunate at this site to, to have that ability. Um, however, when we can't generate on site, we do look at procurement strategies for renewable energy. And there's various ways we do that. Um, we buy re renewable energy certificates or energy efficiency certificates where, where they're available um, and, and where it makes sense for us to do so. Um, so currently, almost all the electricity we use in Europe is from renewable energy sources. And we're looking at opportunities um, through Energize and other ways um, to, to potentially um, buy or supply, have supplied to us um, renewable electricity in other regions across the world as well. Um, so that's some efforts underway at the moment. And then finally, network optimization. And this is really just good business sense, managing um, our operations and networks and products um, in the most optimal way that we can as a business. So whilst this isn't really being done necessarily for for energy or greenhouse gas emission purposes, um, the, the byproduct is that it has a, a, a good um, impact on, on reducing our environmental impact as well. Um, one thing I'll mention is the, the pie um, elements, so the pharmaceuticals in the environment. So um, I'm sure Courtney will speak to this a little bit later in her presentation, but um, the We've been working with the industry, um, so the AMR Industry Alliance, and for several years, um, we're one of the founders and we're also in the board of directors of that organization um, to, to try and minimize the pharmaceutical sector's impact on, on antimicrobial resistance. Um, recently, there's been a certification that's been piloted. And again, I'm not going to take Courtney's glory. I'll let her speak to that, but um, we're really happy and proud um, as Teva was one of the, the pilot organizations um, that are part of that certification process. So with that, I'll say thank you and hand over. Thank you very much, um, Adam. Um, could you just, you're perfect, staring your screen. And then Courtney, I'll let you uh, pull up your slides and I hand over to you. Great, thanks. Perfect. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Nice to be with you today. Um, so, Courtney Soulsby, I'm with BSI, British Standards Institution. Thanks for the introduction earlier. And the topic that we're all talking about today, but hopefully will show some progress and an opportunity for collaboration, is how we better align and standardize the definition of environmental impact around medicines, including carbon and greenhouse gas emissions. So I've quickly put a, a slide up here to, to visualize, I would say in a very crude, basic way, the life cycle of a medicine. So starting at R&D and, and as Amy mentioned, in eco design phase where pharmaceutical manufacturers are starting to incorporate environmental criteria right at the early stages of a new design of new medicines now, going through to clinical trials, commercialized medicine, linking in with a care pathway, um, in a health system environment, reaching the patient and ultimately end of life use. 
And it's really this whole life cycle where there's now this question that's being posed. How do we measure the environmental impact of the medicine across that life cycle? And, and using footprinting or environmental footprinting, carbon footprinting, how do we start to calculate that consistently in our own operations, like Adam was mentioning, you know, embedding it in, in your internal practices, but also aligning it with the wider ecosystem. So one of the first things that I'm hearing is what are some of the environmental considerations we should be taking into account when looking at the life cycle of medicine? And, and I will say that right now, even as a healthcare ecosystem, we're not aligned on, on these categories of importance and, and where priorities should be set. I'm hearing more and more, obviously, greenhouse gas emissions and carbon being a focus um, from manufacturers. But you, you just heard it in Adams, there was a very complimentary presentation looking at pollution and, and wastewater discharge from, from manufacturing sites or PI and, and antimicrobial resistance, looking at waste and circularity and how do we reuse or recycle um, waste that is a byproduct from the production of medicines and, and so on and so on. So how do we really look at each of these categories, but also weigh up the results of each category to make an overall environmental impact measurement decision? And I think that's the challenge we're facing. So we started, I would say, where the global health challenge, so where the E environment meets S social in the ESG language, and started on the topic of antimicrobial resistance. Um, and Adam briefly mentioned this at the end. So top 10 global health challenge where we're actually developing resistance to key antibiotics due to a lot of factors, one of which is discharge in a manufacturing environment. So BSI convened and worked with the AMR Industry Alliance and published an industry standard to actually measure the appropriate amount of concentration of antibiotic discharge with water um, discharge in the manufacturing environment to make sure that the ratio is less than one. And ultimately it's, it's the calculation is PNIC, predicted no effect concentration. I won't get into the detailed science of it behind it, but that's essentially what has been outlined in the standard is how pharma manufacturers would measure the wastewater discharge and the concentration of antibiotics in that discharge. And then we have launched, as Adam mentioned, a certification scheme to actually independently third party validate that sort of that manufacturers have met that industry standard. So there's a kite mark in place. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because um, procurement organizations are now incorporating both the industry standard and also the certification as a simpler means to interpret the evidence from the pharmaceutical manufacturers when procuring key antibiotics. So example here, the Nordics, five countries have come together to put um, a, a combined set of antibiotic environmental requirements where they are referencing a manufacturers must become certified to the AMR standard that has been put out. Um, so an example of where you can take action now to drive improvement in environmental practices. But we're obviously focusing here on carbon and greenhouse gas emissions. So off the back of the learnings we had through this journey with antimicrobial resistance, we've convened an industry ecosystem representing all key stakeholders, academia, regulators, health systems procurement, supply chain members, pharma manufacturers themselves, and BSI as a, a neutral body, I think, is the is the a, a safe set of hands to start to instill some consensus around what is good look like when measuring environmental impact of medicines, which we cannot yet do. So I'll give you two perspectives here of what we found out when we have been engaging with working groups with this convened ecosystem. So health systems first, you know, how are they interpreting? So they're all looking at setting some environmental criteria in their tenders, awarding based on not only cost, quality, or efficacy of medicines, but also now awarding based on environmental impact. So they have um, an appetite, I would say, to drive pharmaceutical manufacturers to make greater use and impact of an environmental perspective. And they're often trying to interpret what we call LCA data, life cycle assessment data, which is being used to measure carbon footprinting. And right now it's not comparable. So they're not really able to say medicine A is less environmental impacts than medicine B. 
um, when reviewing some of this data provided in tender environments. So here are some quotes from the health systems. You know, I can envision a time when environmental footprinting of products influences procurement decisions in the same way price does. There must be standard criteria that's challenging enough, but also know that, you know, we need to remove the sphere of industrial greenwashing. Uh, we, we need to be able to ask from the health systems perspective data in a systematic way, and therefore data will be provided in a systematic way. So any manufacturers, um, you know, sourcing product to multiple geographies and, and having to be, you know, answering lots of different types of criteria and tenders. So there's this need to align at a systems level as well. Um, and, you know, this challenge of legacy medicines and where data is available for existing medicines versus new medicines coming down um, in an R&D environment as well. So that's really the health systems point of view. The, the manufacturer's point of view is, you know, they're very, very keen on making sure that the um, environmental criteria is embedded into their manufacturing life cycle and really looking um, at the end-to-end -end environmental impact. But right now, manufacturer like a Teva will be doing a life cycle assessment method slightly different than AstraZeneca or slightly different than Pfizer. And so, and also have different level of resources and, and expertise to actually devote to this topic. Um, generics will be different than innovative pharma organizations, for example. So, but there's a need to align at least on what method are we using to calculate environmental impact and what are some of the key principles that we need to be taking into account across manufacturers so that the data that is output from this is comparable? So there is, you know, this life cycle and, and looking across that life cycle. So right now, um, the manufacturers, this here's a couple of quotes on them. They're not even agreed on what data points are. You know, here are the 12 categories that we need to be looking at. Um, and then we can start to gather up data on that. Um, other manufacturers are looking at this. If anyone's looking at it, let's share. Let's please share and align, you know, desperation there. Let's not focus on perfection at this stage. Let's try to focus on alignment so that we can actually try to improve. Um, how do we make sure that the data is, is standardized, compared, and mined? Patient um, care must come first um, in, in parallel to environmental consideration. So a key kind of representative of some of the manufacturers feedback we've gotten through the sparking groups. But the positive thing amongst all this is there's now an agreement to have the health systems and the manufacturers work together amongst other key stakeholders in this ecosystem to align on what the environmental impact considerations should be when measuring impact on medicines. So you know, there's many people working in silos. My view that no one is in the lead. We need to have consensus and influence a standard approach. It varies by geography. We need to push forward together. Manufacturers are saying we should work together to inform hospital systems and about sustainable product design and where impact can be made, you know, not on plastics and packaging, but on things like emissions, for example. So just some quotes, uh, and I'll pass this as a, a deliverable off the, after this webinar that really showcase, you know, this alignment across the ecosystem to, to, to drive ch change and, and move forward on this key topic. So BSI, in all, one slide on us is just our role as a neutral convener, I think can really instill some level of trust into this ecosystem. So we're a national standards body and understand how consensus on expectations can be made through standards creation. We're also a global assurance body to assure and assess against those standards. We're a notified body where we understand where standards can influence regulation and the regulatory landscape and sustainability, which is the next thing to come <laughs> in this space, not quite there, but going to come. So how can we ensure that what's created here can influence regulation? So bringing back us to this slide, and I think this is one of my final slides here, just going back to this environmental impact request. How do we measure the environmental footprint of medicines? And, and really looking at these categories, I think the best way to achieve this is to make create standards that define and align the methodology, 
and the boundaries with which and which product categories, which environmental considerations, all should be taken into account when trying to calculate environmental impact. So there's three programs of work that are being scoped and, and finalized right now. One with actually, Amy mentioned the Sustainable Markets Initiative, SMI, to look at this overarching environmental footprint and understand how we would align between system health systems and manufacturers on calculating this overarching environmental footprint. There's also a really specific um, exercise happening to create the carbon footprint output of this. So really specifically looking at taking some of the international standards that are industry neutral. So product environmental footprint, PEF, that's come out of the EU, for example, or ISO 14064 or ISO 14067, which are international standards around footprinting. Let's take the basis of that and make a medicine specific version of that to align on the methodology. And then subsequently, there's also a work stream looking at clinical trials and how we would specifically look to assess the greenhouse gas and, and carbon footprint of clinical trials as well. So I think the intent is that when we drive through a neutral party like ourselves, that we can ultimately have a much more joined up effort that's led on consensus rather than siloed efforts that ultimately doesn't drive what we're all working towards, which is improvement and environmental degradation that's happening in the environment right now. So this is obviously where our priority is for us as an ecosystem is in the greenhouse gas emissions. But I will say that a number of other organizations are focusing on the other environmental categories first as well. So I welcome the community is um, growing and growing fast. Um, uh, this link here can be used to you know, express interest to be continued to inform or participate in this community of practice that we are developing alongside the standards creation. Um, and actually the humanitarian and aid, aid sector are one of the missing links that we really need to have additional voices to make sure what's created is also practical for the use um, and the environments you're operating in as well. Um, so I'd really encourage and welcome support from this industry part of the ecosystem too. Um, but with that, I'll pa stop sharing my screen, I think, of, and then welcome any questions as we progress through. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Courtney and uh, Adam, Amy, for, for your great presentations. Really very, very insightful. Um, so we're going to move uh, on to the question and answer session. So um, please do um, either raise your hand and or um, put your question in the chat. Uh, I will I will give you the floor if you raise your hand. Um, et vous pouvez poser vos questions aussi en français, il n'y a pas de problème. Um, whilst we're um, whilst we're waiting um, for a few questions to come up, um, maybe a, a question from my side um, to whoever wants to take it. Um, maybe to look at basically a bit of the broader picture. If you could talk us a little bit through about where do you see the key challenges when it comes to decarbonization of pharmaceuticals? I think every sector possibly has uh, its own specificities when it comes to um, reducing the, 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 the climate and the environmental impact. So I think it would be interesting to hear what are some of the specificities of the pharmaceutical sectors maybe also linked to where are the, the highest impacts uh, in the production of, of pharmaceuticals. Uh, so if you could talk us through a little bit that, um, maybe, I don't know, Adam, if you if you want to give that one a start. Sure, so <laughs> there's no shortage of challenges. Um, but um, one, one of the main challenges around pharmaceuticals is the, the life cycle of a pharmaceutical in terms of how long it takes to, to get a medicine from kind of R&D and, um, and different stages of R&D all the way through production and, and to kind of to the patient. It's a, a very long time frame, like 10, 15 years. Um, and then to make any changes to, to processes which have been validated and, and shown to kind of 
be effective. Um, it's a, a very convoluted process to, to make any changes after you, you've set your initial processes. So um, actually changing kind of the way we produce is not, not uh, something you can do overnight. Um, it takes sometimes months, years to, to make even things that might seem like a very simple process, like changing the, the propellant gas used in an inhaler, um, a very complex process in itself. Um, in terms of kind of challenges um, on our manufacturing sites, so um, I would say thermal energy. So it's it's doable in most places around the world to to produce or purchase renewable electricity. Um, there's lots of challenges in the market, and and it's a very um, changing market, volatile market, market in, in various areas. So in Europe and, and in North America, the prices of renewable electricity are, are going sky high in the last couple of years. Um, but where, where it's difficult to, to make changes um, just because of the technology that exists today is with thermal energy. So the steam and the heat that you need for, for a manufacturing facility. And it's not easy in those cases to replace um, fossil fuel based um, sources of energy. So there's a lot of work being done around kind of green heat um, and these kind of things, but it's technology which isn't necessarily very developed at this stage. Um, so we're, we're watching what's happening in this area. Um, but yeah, this is, this is one of the challenges I would say in terms of decarbonizing. Okay, thank you. Um, Courtney, Amy, would you like to add something? Yeah, I mean, I can sort of speak to, I guess, the, some of the challenges in the broader health system. Um, and, and I think Courtney touched on it briefly, but there is an ethical question at play here. Uh, you know, what are you prioritizing? Are you prioritizing patient and access to low cost, safe, good quality medication? Are you prioritizing reducing the environmental impact? And, and really the challenge is finding the co-benefits there and trying to find ways that you can provide these medications with, with a low carbon footprint. Um, I also briefly touched on, on the context and I think that's a really important one because the context geographically, geopolitically is very challenging and to engage in some of these initiatives requires countries to have infrastructure in place. It requires companies or countries to have uh, sufficient policy and regulation on environmental issues. So having to, to tackle things in that space can be a big challenge as well. Cost is always an issue. So it can be fairly easy for a big pharma company that's making lots of money to engage in some of these initiatives, but for sort of smaller SMEs or some of the smaller generic companies, it can be very expensive to engage in, in some of these initiatives. So just bearing that sort of cost challenge in mind as well and and then I think awareness is is a big challenge too so getting the awareness out there within companies and across employees but also awareness across the broader health system as well because I think we need to remember that pharmaceutical companies are health system suppliers so if health systems are saying we need x y and z pharmaceutical companies are going to do it so there's also an argument to to be put at the prescribing level do we need to rethink how we prescribe as healthcare practitioners? Do we need to think about, you know, do patients need these medications? Are we over-prescribing and over-diagnosing and, and how that uh, plays into, into the sort of upstream manufacturing as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a, it's a key point that you raise. Of, of course, in the webinar today, we, we really focus on the sort of the procurement part of when we look at how can we reduce the um, the the carbon and environmental impact, but there's of course a whole sort of ecosystem to to look at, notably what is what is actually coming before, like uh, when it comes to uh, over prescription, for example. Um, great, we have a few questions in the chat. Just bear with me for a second. Um, so uh, there is one question to all speakers. Do you see the emergence of uh, greenhouse gas carbon footprinting as an overarching standard? So do you see that development, a potential risk to the recognition of other environmental impacts? Um, and I, I think it's maybe we let Courtney go, go first on this one. Yeah, sure, happy to. I think it's a really good question. Um, 
I think what we are not able to do now is compare between environmental considerations. So if you have a specific medicine and you're looking at the waste lens and looking at packaging and plastics and it's you have a decision or a solution to how to potentially reduce plastics in that specific medicine, but you're also looking at carbon and, and greenhouse gas emissions of creating and manufacturing that medicine. How do you, you have two different results. How do you compare which one would be better implemented or both, or how do you, and I think the problem that we're, we're facing right now in the industry is we're not able to compare an emissions impact change with a waste change with a, um, even with a pollution change, I would say, you know, so um, there's, I, I think that there's a risk. I understand where you're, where you're going with that. And I would say some manufacturers are less mature when it comes to greenhouse gas accounting, but more mature when it comes to the pie, pharmaceuticals and environment topic, um, and vice versa. Some are, you know, more mature on, on pie and less mature on emissions. So I think there's always going to be this risk of trying to accommodate all the environmental considerations whilst also making an impact in one specific area. Um, so in my mind, I don't think necessarily there would be a, a risk of carbon footprinting standard degrading focus on other environmental impacts. I think it would just allow us to make more progress in one, whilst in parallel, we still maintain considering and, and, and trying to have a similar standard developed in some of the other environmental considerations. But hopefully that answers that. It's not straightforward. <laughs> Adam, Amy, do you want to add uh, something to that? Um, one thing I, I would add maybe is just historically, um, we, we've been looking at carbon footprint and other environmental impacts at, a, at an enterprise level, right? So we work with our factories, with our operations to try and reduce the environmental impact. Um, what we're seeing um, is a, a start at looking at a product level. And that obviously comes with a lot of complexities. Courtney mentioned quite a few of them. Um, for for a generics company, um, that's a challenge. You know, Teva has 3,600 products. Um, doing a, an, an life cycle assessment or even a, a simple carbon footprint at that level um, for, for that number of products would be a, a giant undertaking. Um, so uh, we, we often, at the moment at least look at an enterprise level because we can manage our, our environmental risks quite effectively at the enterprise level um, and over time showing that trend that we're reducing our environmental impact which subsequently is filtering down into the products that we make at those manufacturing sites um, so that would be the only thing i would add thank you and it's, uh, i think if, if i could just add i think one other thing is is I think certainly to the public and, and perhaps governments as well, climate change has almost become this sort of representative of all environmental impacts. And there are obviously reasons for that because it's it's a very urgent crisis and it's often in the news and it's represented by big supranational things like COP27 and COP28. Um, but at the same time, there are growing initiatives to get some of these other environmental impact recognized. So for example, the science-based targets initiative is developing one to look at nature. So I think that once these, the sort of public pressure to look at these other environmental impacts starts gaining uh, recognition, that that will hopefully become more broad as opposed to just focusing on carbon footprints. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to take, um, I'm just going to reverse the order of the questions a bit uh, for a matter of flow. Um, a question for Adam regarding um, the supplier engagement. You briefly touched upon it uh, in your presentation, and there is a question uh, um, to, to develop that a little bit further and provide some examples of how you're working with your suppliers um, to, uh, to influence them. Yeah, so it's a good question. Scope scope three is a, a big challenge in, in the world of carbon footprinting and, and decarbonization. So 
Um, Teva uses various routes to, to engage with our suppliers. So we start right at the early procurement stage. Um, so we have a system, or it's not, it's not our system, but we use EcoVardis, which is a way to analyze prospective um, suppliers on their ESG sustainability um, practices and performance. And so even often before we start a, a procurement process with, with a supplier, we will put them through that to, to understand where they are on, on their maturity. Um, we've recently sent out a letter um, signed by our chief procurement officer and our head of ESG um, explaining to our suppliers that already are in our system on what our expectations are around ESG. We have a supplier code of conduct, which um, very clearly sets out what our expectations are. Um, we're members of the pharmaceutical supply chain initiative uh, the responsible health initiative, which are both programs which um, are around working and engaging with the supply chain um, for the pharma sector. Um, we, we're running various programs with them um, in a collaborative way. Um, we've recently done a webinar session with our supply chain. So we invited our, our ESG critical suppliers, um, which includes those with the highest um, kind of our hotspots in terms of carbon um, to webinars to explain to them again what our expectations are and to kind of see how they can participate in the process. So it's um, a two-way conversation really. Um, and then another example would be that Energize program, which was mentioned earlier um, by Amy, which is a collaborative effort again in the pharmaceutical sector to to try and get supply chain members educated and upskilled on what's required to to purchase renewable electricity. Um, and also the intention of that initiative is to, to basically get a virtual power purchase agreement up and running um, in which different supply chain partners would be involved um, and help them to buy the renewable electricity through what is otherwise quite a complex process. So it's to really um, help them along to be able to buy renewable electricity. So giving the tools and, and and the methods um, and not just telling them what the expectations are. I, I may just continue on that same line if I may say, uh, just, I think one of the interesting things about this industry is that suppliers are are stuck with the, with the, because they're often approved through the license holder, you know, approval process of, of new market, new drugs entering into market, the suppliers are named on that authorized license. Um, so the suppliers are really sticky with their ultimate customer, the, the main, main pharmaceutical clients. So I, as Adam was just mentioning, what, one of the things we're being asked for that are, differs a lot from other industry sectors when engaging suppliers on scope three is more education, engagement, capacity building type exercises rather than I will call it the historical master slave relationship that sometimes happens with other industries, which is dictating what, or what is required and you know, requesting data. Um, they're more of trying to educate. The pharma industry seems to be more trying to educate and embed what good practices look like for measuring the suppliers scope one and two emissions so that that can be accounted for as a part of the pharma organization scope three emissions rather than we pharma industry need the scope three emissions, you supplier, you tell us what they are. So I think it's, it's a a, a really different approach um, than some other industries that are looking at this topic. And maybe um, maybe building up uh, on that, because you mentioned the um, sort of buyer-supplier relationship, um, it's uh, maybe a question for, for Adam and maybe Amy, if you looked at it in, or if you found out something in your research as well. Like, what do you already see in terms of um, sort of how this relationship is changing? Like, do you already see a lot of engagement? Like, for example, Adam from from your buyers, uh, um, to that they you got more and more requests um, to to provide data information to you know report on, on your actions. Um, and then there was also a question in the chat uh, quite related to that. Uh, so, what is it? What buyers or procurers? can do to, to sort of move the agenda forward, uh, to drive also innovation um, in the space. Um, so yeah, if you could 
if you could briefly talk uh, talk to that. Yeah, um, I could take, definitely tackle the first one, the, the, the last question. Um, so I think buyers to, to encourage innovation and kind of just to know which company to go with or what product to buy. Um, I think look out for companies and, and Amy mentioned some of these already, but um, look out for companies that have an ESG report, um, go through it, see kind of what they're reporting, if it's genuine, um, see if they submit to CDP, the, what was formerly the Climate Disclosure Project, um, look at their ratings on that, um, use systems and platforms such as EcoVardis to see how companies are performing, um, check if they have science-based targets um, that are committed or validated, um, would be even a, a preference. Um, yeah, just, just see what they can do, um, engage with them as well. Um, but yeah, I think just asking these questions um, triggers the companies to, to do more and to think about kind of innovation and what they're going to be doing in this area. What, what I would add, um, Teva is also, uh, a, we, we have customers um, and suppliers, so we're in a unique position. So we kind of see it from both sides. Um, there is, when there's too many questions from too many people coming in all at once, um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge as well. So um, I, I really appreciate the, the collaborative effort that the pharma sector adopts because it, it limits some of that. So rather than being approached by a hundred different clients, you, you're approached by one client through one dedicated system, for example. So um, these collaborative efforts do take a lot of the hassle um, out of supplying organizations. Um, so be mindful of the additional impact and, and resources that um, some of these requests drive in the in the companies you're asking. Yeah, I mean, I think to to pick up on on both of those questions. So certainly from looking at a lot of the company reports and and speaking to some of these companies, there is quite an active response by suppliers to get involved in some of these initiatives. So some of the pharmaceutical companies will report on you know, what percentage of their suppliers they have engaged with and are these critical suppliers and, and certainly a lot of them set targets to, for example, have 75% of their uh, suppliers report to Ecovardis, um, as Adam mentioned as well. So there is action there. I think one interesting um, stat that I, I read today was that enough companies have signed up for the Energize program to be able to reduce the uh, energy emissions that are that is equivalent to the annual emissions from a country the country of singapore so that's massive that's really great engagement by suppliers to get involved in initiatives like that um and i mean obviously there there is there does also need to be ongoing collaborations and um uh, awareness around these issues especially with suppliers that are in geographic locations that aren't as familiar with a lot of these in, environmental impacts but I think two sort of um, one rather <laughs> Adam mentioned the role of, of procurers in this. And one anecdote that I heard recently was procurers not giving back pallets that uh, pharmaceutical companies ship out medication on, which means that pharmaceutical companies then have to go and buy new pallets and all of the emissions that come with you know, producing those and sourcing them and everything. So there is also a role for procurers to not enhance the upstream environmental impact. And I think it goes back to the point that I was I was making earlier as well, to really think about what medication you need and to rethink things like hoarding medication, storing it, thinking about expiry dates, et cetera. Because if we can solve some of those downstream uh, procurement problems, then a lot of the upstream stuff will follow from that as well. Just maybe one point, if I could add, if, if, if feasible, is um, is incorporate environmental criteria into the award criteria. So the the weighting in, in the tenders that are being produced. So um, there's still a lot of, I would say, superficial questions being asked in tenders that require a lot of data mining from the pharma manufacturers to evidence the questions, but actually there's still no clout or weighting or you know, decision, decision factors that are actually incorporated against the environmental questions that are being asked in tenders. So 
I, I mean, I think the Nordics are, are leading the way in best practice. They're weighting environmental criteria 30% of their decision-making um, overall cri um, criteria. So 30% to that, 30% to efficacy, and then 30% to quality and safety. So, um, oh, sorry, 30% to environment, 30% to cost, and then 30% to quality, safety, and efficacy. So I just feel like my, my one piece of advice to encourage innovation and actually driving impact would be to actually weight the environmental considerations in, in your tenders. Excellent, thank you. We, um, we have another question in the chat for Amy. Um, really interesting to read about your study. Um, the manufacturers um, that you're covering in the study are uh, mostly Europe and US based. And the question is, um, do you know of any uh, even planned studies related to India or China based generic suppliers and their environmental reporting? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. And the answer is there is a massive gap in academic research across the pharmaceutical industry as a whole, but especially in the generic companies, a lot of uh, whom, as you mentioned, are based in India and China. So the answer is no. Uh, there are one or two Chinese studies that look at the overall carbon footprint of the pharmaceutical industry within those um, within China, but they're very much uh, based on you know calculating the carbon footprint as opposed to any sort of actionable uh, response from there. But in the good news, um, that is actually going to be a step forward in my own research. So I am engaging with companies in India uh, who are generic companies there. So hopefully some more insight will come from that in the future. Excellent. Um, let me see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, maybe one, one more qu question as, as we're waiting for potential other questions from the chat. Um, and, you know, you briefly touched upon it uh, in, in your presentations and, and, and through your response to it now, but it's it's basically a question that comes up um, a lot um, when we discuss with, with partners or, or buyers. It's, okay, how, how do I know what is greenwashing and, and what is an actual initiative? Um, so, as I said, you already uh, briefly mentioned a few examples, but maybe if you could just um, develop uh, again a little bit on that point uh, regarding the difficulty um, for, for procurers to actually know, okay, the, the re reply uh, from, from, a, from a company uh, on certain questions like, okay, is, can I actually trust the information? Whoever wants to go first. I mean, I can I can chip in a little bit. I think there's there's a really challenging dilemma between the concepts of greenwashing and green hushing. So green hushing is where you just don't report on anything because you're scared that you'll be called out on it. Whereas greenwashing is this idea that you are reporting uh, activity in the environmental space in a more positive light than you're actually engaging with. So there's a real balance there, and I think it's 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 very difficult sometimes to tell um, whether things are being greenwashed. And there's also, I think, a lack of awareness sometimes in people who are calling companies out on greenwashing because they're not entirely sure what some of these targets, for example, means or what the initiatives, um, uh, what they'll be able to, to reduce and to tackle. But I think one way to think about it is to triangulate. So if you, for example, look at what's being reported publicly, look at what's being reported in the press and look at what is being uh, spoken about. And you triangulate those three things, also bearing in mind how companies are reporting, are they aligning it with solid methodologies? Are they aligning it with uh, science-based initiatives, for example, and, and really pulling, pulling that out. But again, I think if a company makes a target and doesn't have a plan to back that up, I would be wary of that. Absolutely. Uh, Courtney, Adam, do you want to chip in on, on this one? Um, nothing in addition to what I mentioned previously, but yeah, things such as SPTI, CDP, just, just there, there are standards, there's initiatives in place that if a company signed up to them and they're considered the gold standard, etc., cetera, it, it would give one a little bit more confidence in, in what the organization behind it's doing. So look out for those kind of 
good standards and good certifications, et cetera, that, that show what a company is doing. Okay. I agree. Courtney, did you want to? Sorry, I didn't. I wasn't sure if you wanted to add on something. Okay. No, that's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Perfect. So um, we're coming. We're coming to the end. Uh, to the end of the session. So um, I'll I'll give the floor to to all three of you just to wrap up uh, and maybe yeah to um, give uh, you know if you have one advice to give then uh, what would that be um, and then we're gonna we're gonna wrap up the session. Um, Amy, you spoke first, so I'll, I'll give you the floor first. <laughs> <laughs> That's good because uh, it means that I can get my idea out there, but also back I have to think on the spot. So no, I, I think I think the the biggest advice that I would give is just to get the word out there and to spread awareness around these issues. I speak to so many stakeholders involved in the broader health system, and um always quite concerned by the lack of awareness around some of these issues spanning from the patients to the healthcare professionals uh, to procurers health systems etc so i think once we we really are aware of this issue we can push forward together as as a collective health ecosystem to really drive innovation collaboration and and change excellent uh, adam um, so I would say collaboration is the key here. So when we're talking about decarbonization, it's scope one, two, and three. Um, and you're never going to just be able to decarbonize your own emissions so by, by managing your own operations. So it's really around collaboration and, and that engagement um, with suppliers and also customers in some cases. I think the only thing I would probably add as a piece of advice is is collaboration with, with an outcome in mind. Um, I think there's a lot of forums in place right now that are having really nice sandwiches and really nice debates around the topic. Um, and I think the one thing I would just say is when, when looking at what areas to collaborate with or what programs to collaborate with, just have, you know, challenge the outcome with which they're they're trying to um, work against um, and you know what is tangible as it relates to success in some of these collaboration efforts that would be um, I think one piece of advice that I would give is, is you know what tangibly will will the organization or the program of work look to actually deliver as a, as a result to your time effort expertise um, and resource that you you devote to the collaboration excellent so uh, thank you very much to to all three of you. Uh, I think it's been a very insightful presentations. Um, on the one hand, hearing from Amy about the sort of the, the broader agenda, also how the topic um, is really taking up pace uh, when it comes to uh, sort of international commitments on how different health systems are actually committing to action. So it's uh, sort of really encouraging to hear. And then hearing from Adam about, you know, what, what are... What are some of the actions that uh, Teva Pharmaceuticals is is putting in place, um, and to to see you know how much progress you already made, and and Courtney regarding the um, development of a sort of streamlined methodology for the sector on on at the product carbon. Uh, footprint or even broader environmental footprint. Um, I think some of the key outcomes are is to basically start start asking the questions um, when you uh, when you engage with with your suppliers. Really, basically, uh, as Amy said, get get the word out there so that uh, your suppliers know that this is something that sort of matters to you. Um, and uh, also very much. Uh, sort of appreciate the the info from Courtney regarding the the weighting criteria. Uh, that Nordic, Nordic countries are already um, uh, are already using when it comes to selecting uh, the offers, and then of course uh, uh, you know sort of looking out for for trustworthy uh, organizations. You named a couple of them. Um, I'm not going to repeat them. So um, yeah, but basically getting getting started on the topic. Um, we're going to be very happy to sort of keep in touch with uh, with all three of you. Uh, also, you know, sort of hear uh, progress uh, on the different uh, projects all of you are working on. Um, very happy to to sort of keep uh, engaged uh, with uh, with all three of you. 
um, some uh, sort of uh, marketing for our next webinar that will take place on July 4th, uh, same time, uh, 1 p.m. Uh, Central European time, uh, where we will cover the issue of uh, roofs. So it's a different topic, but it's basically all about what can you do with your roof, be it installing solar panels or uh, doing cool roofs. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll send out some more information um, as soon as possible. Uh, and then, yeah, looking forward to seeing you uh, again in one of our upcoming webinars. So thank you once again to, um, to our speakers and uh, wishing you a nice uh, rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.